why are there so many videos out there in the YouTube universe that are all about not saying, don't say, avoid saying? Well, essentially, most of the time, the language that they're telling you to not say is perfectly acceptable, it's okay, but it's boring, it's dull, it's uninteresting, and it's basic. In today's lesson, I am gonna share with you a lesson on don't say, but I'm throwing quite a lot of language at you all at once. Around about 47 idioms and indeed a little bit of slang as well. Essentially, I want you to avoid saying, not say, don't say, these rather basic English expressions to express how you feel or how you feel about someone else or to describe a person. <sighs> I'm tired. <sighs> oh yeah, I'm really am tired. I'm hungry. I am so sorry. They are crazy. She is so angry. I'm sorry, I'm really busy. Wow, he's lazy. I'm waiting. I'm interested. I'm bored. He is stupid. I'm not stupid. So the idea of today's lesson is to sound more natural, native and creative. So without further ado, let's get on with the lesson. Native, natural, native and creative. 47-ish expressions, idioms and slang to avoid using all of these words. Right, number one to be worn out. I am worn out. You can also use it as a phrasal verb to wear someone out. Essentially, this means I'm tired. All of these next expressions mean I'm tired. So when you are worn out, you're saying, it's an adjective, I am really, really tired. I have been with the kids all day and I am worn out. Can you just go and bath them and look after them for me just for a few minutes? Or you can use it as the phrasal verb, the kids wore me out. A nice, simple way and certainly more natural way to say I'm tired in English. Very commonly used. Number two, I am dead on my feet. I have not stopped at work all day. I just need to lie down on the sofa and do nothing. I'm dead on my feet. Ooh, can barely keep my eyes open. Mm. Okay, it's a little bit extreme. But essentially, you know that feeling at the end of the day or you've been watching some TV in the evening and you just need to go to bed. You cannot keep your eyes open. So if you say this to someone, oh, I can't keep my eyes open. I'm gonna have to go home, sorry. Or I'm gonna have to go to bed. Then you're saying you are extremely tired. It's pretty self-explanatory. It's not too much of a tricky idiom there for you. And number four, you can also say, I am ready to drop, okay? Not literally drop but essentially drop into bed, I suppose. If you say, I'm ready to drop, I have had such a hectic, meaning busy day, I just need to relax now, I need to go home, drop on the sofa maybe, but you wouldn't say it in that way. You'd simply say, I am so tired, I'm ready to drop. Or even just say, I've had such a busy day, I'm ready to drop. It expresses that you are tired within that idiom. You don't actually need to say, I'm tired. Now, I'm hungry hungry. Nothing wrong with hungry and indeed there are lots of other adjectives to express hunger. You could be extreme and say I'm starving. You could say I'm famished. I love that. That's a little bit more posh. But we've also got some nice idioms. I could eat a horse. I am so hungry I could eat a horse. Combine it together or not, it doesn't really matter. Is dinner ready? I could eat a horse. Now, obviously you're not actually going to eat a horse, although I do know in some parts of Europe we do. Um, in England, we don't eat horses. But essentially you're saying you are that hungry, you could eat a very, 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 very large animal like a horse. But yeah, you probably won't want to. As I said before, you could use, I'm famished, I'm famished, I could eat an elephant. Or I'm famished, I could eat a horse. Combining a more extreme adjective, with a nice idiomatic expression is fantastic. But of course, remember that depending on the situation, you might not want to use this expression. So if you're in a restaurant, a posh restaurant, maybe with work colleagues or on a romantic date, 
you don't really want to say, oh, I'm so hungry, I could eat a horse, because you're trying to make a good impression. It's more in informal situations with your friends, with your family. So I'm famished, I could eat an elephant. Number seven, I'm hangry. This is kind of modern slang, and in fact, what it means is hungry and angry. So when you get so hungry, I was gonna say so angry, when you get so hungry that you become kind of irritable and angry and you just need to eat. Uh, I've noticed that men become hangrier, hangrier, yes, you can do that, um, more, hang more hangry or hangrier than women. You just make up words as you go along here, guys. Um, but yeah, I think men are more likely to be hangry than women. Let me know what you think. Number eight, a little bit of Cockney rhyming slang for you. Hank Marvin. I am Hank Marvin. I'm starving. If you know anything about Cockney rhyming slang, you know that we can take two words, or indeed a name, Hank Marvin, and make it rhyme. The last word rhymes with the thing you are trying to describe. So Cockney rhyming slang, I'm Hank Marvin, I'm starving. Number nine, if you want to express that you're feeling a little bit hungry, be a little bit more ladylike perhaps, uh, in a restaurant um, and your boyfriend, your husband said, oh, are you hungry? Would you like to have a starter? Uh, you might say, oh yes, I am rather peckish. I, I could go for a starter. So peckish means that you're a little bit hungry. A little bit like birds peck at food, okay? You're peckish, you could eat something little. So that works quite well. And much better than saying I'm famished, I could eat an elephant. So remember, depending on the situation, which expression you would use best. I'm sorry. Sorry, that wasn't very sincere, was it? I'm sorry, I'm, I'm so sorry. Okay, fine, but we can be more creative than that. American English that has actually come over to the UK, we would also use my bad, my bad, my mistake. But my bad is definitely more informal and colloquial American English that we now use more in British English. So you could say my bad, my bad. You're accepting responsibility for something and apologizing. Now, if you swear and you didn't mean to, or you did mean to, but you want to sound a little bit more polite, you can say, pardon my French, oh, pardon my French. Um, essentially saying the F word or or whatever kind of swear word in English you do say. Um, none of them are really French, but it's kind of saying, I don't know where this came from actually, I should probably research it. But yeah, it's just saying, um, oh, sorry for swearing, I shouldn't have sworn. But you could also use it before you swear, so preparing someone for the fact that you're going to swear. Pardon my French, but I can't believe what a complete twat he has been. Or what a load of bollocks, pardon my French. Number 12, really a little bit more extreme when you're really feeling guilty, I screwed up, I screwed up. I think again, this might be more of an American phrasal verb, but we use it in the UK. To screw up is to make a very big mistake. I screwed up, it's the last time, I promise. I, I'll make sure that I'm here on time when you say next time, promise. Number 13, you might say to someone when they're feeling particularly guilty for a mistake that they've made, for something they've done, you might say, come on, you've got to stop beating yourself up. Stop beating yourself up. You're not actually beating yourself up physically, but more mentally and emotionally when you feel guilty about something. You can't beat yourself up. You did the right thing. You broke up with her. You weren't happy in the relationship. Leave it there. Now, crazy. Is it any wonder that in the UK we have so many different expressions and idioms to describe someone as being crazy? I think possibly we've got more idioms for I'm crazy or she's crazy than any other. Here are just a few. Number 14, to be as nutty as a fruitcake. To be as nutty as a fruitcake. Now you may think that a fruitcake is only full of fruit, but I guess there's some that's got nuts in. And nuts is another informal slang, colloquial way of saying someone is crazy. So you can say as nutty, she's as nutty as a fruitcake, or you could just simply say she's nuts, or she's nutty, you choose. Now number 15 is a slang word that I had uh, an Italian student once, lovely girl, very advanced, but she came across this word bonkers. And I noticed once she'd learnt this word, she just wanted to keep using it. She loved the word bonkers. If you say someone is bonkers, it's a kind of fun way. It's not too insulting, but it's a nice way to say someone's a little bit crazy. You did what? You ran half a marathon? 
are you bonkers? So you can see it's not about being really, really crazy, just about doing something or behaving in such a way that's unusual or extreme, perhaps. Bonkers. So number 16, to be off your rocker. I imagine this kind of like rocking chair motion, someone being a bit crazy, but it's not that extreme or that insulting. You want to get back with your ex? Do you remember how she treated you? Are you off your rocker? Are you crazy? So yeah, that's a nice idiomatic expression for you to use. Not too insulting, but remember using it in a, in a suitable context. Really, it's very informal. So you wouldn't tell your boss that they're off their rocker or crazy, would you? So just think how, and where, and with whom you use this expression. We've also got as mad as a box of frogs. That's quite a fun one, but I think I've used that in another lesson, so I won't include it in this one, but I just did, so we'll tag it on the end there. To be as mad as a box of frogs. Right, if you're angry or someone else is angry, you can use many other expressions, including extreme adjectives, but these idioms are a great way to express how angry someone is. She nearly bit my head off when I suggested we do things differently. To bite someone's head off is to say something, to do something, to react to them in a certain way, to express anger, disagreement, irritation, annoyance. So if you bite someone's head off or if someone bites your head off, they are not happy. They are angry and you've done something perhaps to upset them. Okay, don't bite my head off. I was just making a suggestion. Number 18, to go ballistic to become really, really angry. When I came home late and my husband had been trying to call me all day, but my phone had been switched off, he went ballistic. He was really worried where I had been. When she spoke to me like that, I just saw red. Meaning I became so angry, I just could only see my anger. So if you see red, you are very, very angry. Someone has really done something to upset you. They've been rude, they've insulted you, and you've seen red and perhaps reacted in a rather strong way. Think about red referring to kind of the color of your eyes becoming filled with blood when you become so angry, when they're bloodshot. Bit extreme, I don't think any of us actually look like that unless we're a cartoon character. Number 20, if something makes your blood boil, think about when you're angry, how hot and flustered you become. So we could say your blood boils, like water when you boil the kettle to make a cup of tea. Very British analogy there. But yes, so when you say he made my blood boil when he suggested we cancel the event just because his mum couldn't make it, I became very, very angry. Number 21, when someone really loses their temper, when they become so angry and they have no control, you can say that they flew off the handle. They flew or they fly off the handle. It is very informal, but it's a very common expression you will hear in English. She flies off the handle so easily, it's really not worth confronting her on this. 22, to be up in arms, up in arms. I kind of feel this could be referring to protesting, up in arms. And in fact, I think this is a, a great way that we could actually refer to how people feel, some people, about these vaccine passports, things like this. People are up in arms. They're kind of going, what's going on? And protesting as well. But you kind of think about people flinging their arms up in the air. They are up in arms about vaccine passports. Now, I'm busy. I'm busy, I'm busy, I'm busy. Saying I'm busy is very boring and can sometimes actually sound a little bit rude if someone's asking you if you wanna go for a drink or something along these lines. So to say simply I'm busy, not very effective, certainly not very creative. You could instead say, I'm so sorry, I'm snowed under at work at the moment so I really don't have time to go for a drink. So to be snowed under, to have a lot of things on top of you, work to do, that you haven't got time to do something. Now number 24, take your pick. My personal choice is to say I'm up to my eyes in reports. I'm up to my eyes in marking. Again, referring to how much of something you have to do. You can even say I'm up to my eyes in laundry, washing. You could also say I'm up to my ears or I'm up to my neck. Less common, but again, if you want to kind of just express how much of something you've got to do needs to be in this area, eyes, ears, neck, then you're saying, I have got so much of this thing to do, I don't have time for anything else, I'm really busy. I'm up to my eyes in marking, I wish I could come out for a walk. Number 25, you can also say, I'm as busy as a beaver, or she's been as busy as a beaver. 
It also expresses how hard someone has been working to get something done. She's been as busy as a beaver cleaning the house all day. You could, of course, also use the expression busy as a bee. Think about how hard working bees and beavers are. Beavers building dams, pretty hard work, and bees flying around all day collecting pollen to make honey. So these are particularly hard working creatures, insects, animals, um, and a good way to express how busy you are or someone else. Now I've got three nice expressions here for you to express how lazy someone could be. If you call someone a couch potato, a couch potato, this is actually referring to somebody that sat watching TV all day, not doing very much, just literally on the couch or sofa, whichever you prefer, but we'd say couch potato, not sofa potato. <laughs> so couch potato, someone that sits on the couch all day watching Netflix. But to be honest, it's nice to sometimes be a couch potato. I am occasionally, quite a lot actually lately. Yeah, through lockdown. I think my sofa actually has an ass print in it from me. So I could admit to being a little bit of a couch potato. 27, you could use this in quite a nice way. Again, not with a boss or anyone like that, perhaps with a friend or perhaps with children to say someone's a lazy bones. Don't be such a lazy bones. You can do your homework. Come on, it's just gonna take half an hour. A little stronger, a little more insulting if you call someone bone idle. Bone idle, he is bone idle. He does nothing. It kind of suggests that they're lazy and also not particularly intelligent. So it is stronger. The girl in our group is bone idle. She's done nothing to help us with the presentation work at all. Now, if you want to express that you are waiting, you're waiting for someone or someone is waiting for you, we've got these expressions. You can lose or you can run out of patience. Come on guys, I'm running out of patience now. We need to get going. Meaning I'm tired of waiting, we need to go. Or I'm losing my patience. We need to go. I'm not prepared to wait anymore to be patient for you. To stay or wait until the grass has grown under your feet. So this is when someone is kind of standing around for a long time uh, to the point that grass is growing around them. Now this is ridiculous and not going to happen. But if you say this, it means you're waiting for such a long time. Come on, don't let the grass grow under your feet. You need to get things going. Try applying for a few jobs. I'm sure you'll get something. So essentially you're saying to someone, don't wait, don't delay, be proactive. Now number 31, to wait until the cows come home or stay or do something until the cows come home. We could argue until the cows come home for a really long time, for an indefinite period, but it might not make any difference. At this rate, you won't finish the project until the cows come home. So you're taking such a long time that really I'm waiting for you and nothing's happening and I'm getting tired of waiting. And then my personal favorite, before Christmas would be nice, before Christmas. So uh, we obviously have Christmas just once a year, so usually it feels like it's a long way off, but I might say it'd be great if I could have that project before Christmas, would be lovely. So essentially we're saying, you know, get it done. I don't want to keep waiting until Christmas, but we're not actually referring to Christmas. We're just expressing the fact that we have to wait a long time for something. I'm interested. I'm interested. There are lots of ways to express your interest, including some nice phrasal verbs like being keen on something. But in this case, I want to look at three idiomatic expressions. I'm game. I'm game. So this essentially means I'm interested, I'm ready, I'm willing to have a go at this thing. Do you fancy going for a swim down the beach? Yeah, I'm game, let's go. So nice, informal and colloquial. Number 34, if you're so interested in something that you couldn't tear yourself away, you couldn't move from that spot from whatever you were doing or watching or listening to. The book was so interesting. I couldn't tear myself away. I couldn't tear myself away. 35, if you live and breathe something, live and breathe something, it means you are very passionate about it and very, very interested. So as an example, uh, there are many people that live and breathe sports. They're interested in different kinds of sports, perhaps football. Maybe you live and breathe football. You want to play football. You want to watch football on the TV. You want to go to the matches. You've got merchandise. You live and breathe football. You are so interested in it. 
Now from interested to bored, the opposite, bored. Now, there are lots of ways to express you're bored rather than just saying on its own, I'm bored. You can say, I'm bored to tears. I am so bored that I wanna cry, basically. Oh my goodness, that film, it bored me to tears. I couldn't believe I watched it until the end. So boring. You can be bored to death, bored silly or bored stiff, okay? All of these expressions are nice. They're expanding on just saying I'm bored. I was bored to death listening to Boris Johnson's speech the other day. I was bored silly in class. We didn't do anything except listen to the teacher. I was bored stiff, meaning stiff is like when you can't move. So it's kind of similar to bored to death. Bored so much that you just oh, you can be bothered to move from the spot. I was bored stiff listening to my mum go on and on about her soap operas. And then number 40, a great idiomatic expression, it was like watching paint dry. Listening to guys talk about cars is like watching paint dry. Yeah, for me it is. Just as the same guys as it might be for you, I'm being very sexist here really, but if your girlfriend starts talking to you about makeup or shoes or bras, it's probably like watching paint dry. If anyone has tried to watch paint dry, then you'll know how boring it probably is. I can't imagine anyone doing that. Um, so it's a lovely idiomatic expression to really exaggerate how bored you were. Now, when you want to tell someone that you are not stupid, um, if you think someone's behaving in a way towards you that is treating you like you're a bit of an idiot, then you might want to say, I may be daft, but I'm not stupid. So in this way, you're admitting that maybe sometimes you might be a bit silly or miss something or not understand, but you're not thick. You, you do understand what's going on. It's often when someone is really questioning your common sense and basic knowledge that you should have. Of course I won't leave the baby on its own in the bath. I might be daft, but I'm not stupid. And then 42, a great expression to say, I wasn't born yesterday. I wasn't born yesterday. This is referring to being naive and experienced. Basically, this means that you can't be easily fooled. If someone's trying to tell you a lie, to mislead you in some way, you can say, come on, I wasn't born yesterday. You're telling me that vase broke by itself? I don't think so. The football's there and you've been playing in the garden. I wasn't born yesterday. Now, if you want to describe another person as being stupid, so you, this was not being stupid, now you're saying someone is stupid. Again, lots of lovely expressions. 43 and 44 are very, very similar. You could say that someone is not the sharpest knife in the drawer not the sharpest knife in the drawer. Essentially, when we talk about someone being sharp, you could say, oh, he's, he's quite sharp, meaning he's quite intelligent. So when we say he's not the sharpest knife in the drawer, we're not saying he's actually a knife, you can cut him, but he's not particularly intelligent compared to others, perhaps. And in the same way, we could use, he's not the sharpest tool in the shed or the box. He's not the sharpest tool in the shed or the box. A shed is where, in, in the UK at least, we usually keep all our garden tools, things like this. So he's not the sharpest tool, like a hammer, a chisel, something like this, uh, in the box or in the shed. They're very, very similar, basically just meaning they're not very clever. They're not completely stupid, but certainly not as intelligent as everybody else. He decided to paint the bench in the rain and it got really wet. And clearly the paint just looked a complete mess afterwards. He's really not the sharpest tool in the box. The lights are on, but no one's home. <laughs> the lights are on, but no one's home. Essentially, the person might be speaking, talking, interacting, but there's something about them that you can see they're just not understanding what's going on. Perhaps you're in a lecture, you're listening to your lecturer talk, and you might say about another student in the class, well, I think with her, the lights are on, but no one's home. In the same way, we can refer to not the brightest bulb in the box. Bulb is basically the, the light bulb, that thing, that you put into a light to turn it on, to have electricity and light. So when you say they're not the brightest bulb, bright is another synonym of intelligent. So we're saying they're not particularly clever. And finally, ending with thick as two short planks. She's as thick as two short planks. Thick is a synonym of stupid. It's the opposite of thin, thick. Um, but in this case, we're using it as a synonym. 
to say that someone is really, really stupid. It is very rude, so don't use it to anyone's face. Don't use it in the wrong circumstance. You wouldn't want to refer to a colleague as being thick as two short planks. It is very rude. So what would be an extreme example of someone being really stupid? She went out and left the oven on. We came back and the chicken was completely burnt. She is as thick as two short planks, honestly. What was she thinking? So, there we have it. If you have got any other idioms, expressions and slang, to replace any of those kind of more dull, uninteresting adjectives, then do comment below and share. And of course, if any of these expressions are new for you, please use them. Comment below, tell me about somebody that you think might be as thick as two short planks, or maybe someone that isn't the sharpest tool in the box. Have you ever flown off the handle and become so angry and enraged? What made you fly off the handle? And do you often find that you could eat a horse? Do you get hungry quite a lot? What time of the day? Let me know, comment below. Some fun, natural, native, creative expressions and idioms that you can use day to day in English to avoid using some of those more basic adjectives to just help boost your vocabulary range, broaden your language and sound a little bit more native in English. Right, I better go, I'm feeling a bit Hank Marvin.